Um, thanks everybody for coming here today. Um, obviously, we've got uh, quite the luminary in the form of Nippon. Um, let's start at the start where all good stories begin, Nippon. Um, your resume in the working world is, is quite, uh, quite brilliant. Um, you know, obviously Boston, BCG, Amazon, uh, Flipkart, of course uh, Sequoia as well. Um, you, you, you obviously you spend time in, in retail, merchandising, um, um, e-commerce product as well, engineering. So you saw you ran the whole gamut of, of functions that basically power what you do at Ula as well. So was that premeditated? I mean, did entrepreneurship come to you then? Or did you go into the working world with a view of, in, in the longer term, go into entrepreneurship? Well, f hello everyone. Um, good to be here. And thanks for having me. Uh, this is an interesting question, okay? So I'm sure there must be some entrepreneurs out here and some uh, maybe listening online. Uh, Yes, it does look in some ways that it just the career went in a certain path. Uh, but truth be told, my first company, and this is a bit that not many people know, it's deep down on my LinkedIn profile somewhere, which nobody gets to, is that I, ha I did my first startup when I was in college. And it was the year 99, 2000, the peak of the dot-com uh, bubble. Everybody was an entrepreneur. Everybody wanted to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and I was in college and I wanted to be one too, so I took some money from my dad, created a company uh, that actually went nowhere. <laughs> I lost some of my dad's money and uh, then I was like, okay, let me gather some experience, some maturity before I do my next thing. So that's when, uh, uh, that's when I said that, okay, yeah, I don't know how long it will take, uh, but I will come back to being an entrepreneur. Uh, all I knew at that time, and in fact, if anybody had told me that 20, it'll take 20 years, I would have been like, no way. You know, I, I would have imagined three years, five years, 10 years, somehow it ended up taking 20. If someone had told me that it would, that you know, I was a 19-year-old uh, kid in Delhi, uh, in India, uh, had said that you will be building a startup in Indonesia, uh, which I had never visited or thought about or even like beyond geography class I had no idea about Indonesia at the time um, I'd be like okay this person doesn't know uh, like, there is no conceivable path that can take me to Indonesia right? and yet that's how life happens so um, obviously entrepreneurship was in your blood and it seems as if you know at a subconscious level at least when you went into the working world you are building skills and building functionalities in all the in all the areas, you know, the key core areas that will form the backbone of, of ULA, uh, ultimately, right? Um, what did you learn from the working world? Would you advise entrepreneurs to ve to be very cognizant about building value, building skills, building network, even before going into entrepreneurship, or would you would you advise the opposite, like you know, a la Bill Gates, for example? Yeah, great question. Okay, so let me, let me, before I get to specifically here, let me talk a little bit about the bit that I did not answer from your last question. Uh -huh. did, was, it, was it premeditated that I will take this path? That part was not true, but it so happened that every step, I knew I was gaining a new skill in whichever job I went. So even though it feels like, okay, he starts out with coding as a software engineer, and then you know, all the way to being an investor, along the way running a p &L, building product, raising money, all the kind of things, which somehow would eventually culminate in having all the skills required as a founder. Is that the right path to take? Maybe. Uh -huh. Is there other, other paths that get you there easily? So there is nothing that says that you have to wait 20 years and take all those skills along the way before you start. Uh -huh. In fact, my view, if I were to, with the benefit of hindsight, and obviously this is my personal opinion, uh -huh, is that we, I needn't have waited 20 years to start. Yes, I would have been short by a few skills, I would not have all the skills, but I would have had enough, right? Uh -huh. But for various reasons, I hung on, and you know, sometimes the cash in the bank looks too good, and then you're like, okay, uh -huh. Am I ready to go back to no salary? Am I ready to go back to you know, uh, staying in budget hotels versus staying in nice hotels? Uh, and if you really want to do it, you'll just do it. How old were you when you went into entrepreneurship? How old Which did you, one? you know, the, first the, one the second, or the second one? one. <laughs> 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 uh, 
Uh, I was 37, 38. Okay, so so not not exactly you know the the classic spring chicken lah. Right? No, of course no. Um, and that's actually what I'm saying is that yeah. I wish if I had if I if I were to if I were to go back and rewrite certain chapters, I would go back and say I should have started when I was 32, 33. There was nothing new. I mean, of course, I learned a lot in the 32 to 37, but none of that was something I could not have learned anywhere. So there is somewhere, and this answer varies for every single individual out there based on the quality of the work that you do, somewhere there is a tipping point where you've done enough and your learning seems to be tapering. At that point, it's by all means, that's the point to just start. And the sooner the better. I mean, different people get there at different times. But Were there any skill sets that you think you picked up in the working world which are you know, typically axiomatic of being in entrepreneurship, whether it's coding, whether it's learning how to uh, face uh, fund manager or investors. I mean, what, what kind of skills uh, came in most importantly to you? I would say all of the above. And uh, probably this is the, the benefit. So I talked about starting earlier, but now the other side of that is today, when I speak to an engineer, I speak their language. When I speak to an investor, I speak their language. Right. When I speak to uh, an employee on the business side, a salesperson, I speak their language. Right. I know what it's like to be them. I know their incentives, I know their pain, I know what they're looking for, and that makes a conversation so much easier because it's no longer transactional. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I, th I think we'll let's switch to your time in Sequoia where obviously, you know, you, you came across a vast network of entrepreneurs you know what uh, basically um, big investors want to buy or, or not want to buy in investors, uh, in, in, in entrepreneurs. You know, what, what can you tell the audience in terms of what you know, basically blue chip investors like uh, Sequoia look for in an entrepreneur? So I would, uh, uh, so I was going to answer something and then you said in an entrepreneur. So I'm going to go with that first. Well, let's, let's, let, let, Versus let's in let a company. in any way you like. Okay. Yeah. Because, uh, okay, so let's start with the entrepreneur, okay, because the, why I, why I ask that is because the importance of the entrepreneur changes as the company grows, right? Today, how many people here know who founded, let's say, IBM or some large company like that that, is, that has been around for a long time? It doesn't matter who the founder was, right? Uh -huh. So over time, the entrepreneur matters less. The earlier, the earlier stage of the company, and IBM I only named as an illustration, but uh, the, early stage, the earlier the stage of the company, the more important the founding team is. Right? And when, when, at least when I was at Sequoia, uh, I'll actually say, uh, one, one conference somebody asked me a very interesting question, and I was on some panel discussion, was, you know, in India, how many of you would know that IITs are very reputed, uh, difficult places to get into and uh, highly reputed and therefore a lot of founders come out of IITs. Uh, so somebody got up and asked me, why do VCs only give money to IITs? And at least my, per my view was it's not that they're from IIT. It's more to me about the fact that when you're 15, 16, 17, Okay, at a time when you should, many of your friends are out partying or dating or other stuff, somebody there is sacrificing that part of their life to work super hard for a test that they have to pass to get into this institution. So it's not so much about the IIT, it's about the grit. You can find that in other places. I met somebody who was a, a national level swimming team member. And uh, this lady used to get up at like 5 a.m., 6 a.m., doesn't matter how cold or hot or what it is, and go for her swim practice. Right? To me, that is grit. Because entrepreneurship, at least in our kind of entrepreneurship, you're starting from zero. And as we all know, and now as we're seeing with what's happening in the markets, it just gets harder. So you have to have the character to be able to withstand that, to get through that. So if I, when I was at Sequoia, especially with the very early stage stuff, I would look at the founder, these traits and the founder. Now, that's not the only thing. That's necessary but not sufficient. Then you have to look at other things. What is the market? Are you actually addressing something which is a massive opportunity? Because 
Uh, most funds look for seven to 10 year horizons, at least the early stage ones, which means you are, you're actually trying to imagine the world 10 years from now. Right? So the opportunity, if the market is large, then you, know, you can go a little bit left, a little bit right, and find a path that gets you to some large value. If the market is small, no matter how left or right you go, I mean, imagine a fish in a small pond, right? Like, no matter how many turns it makes, it's always just going to be that. So 10 years later, it's still small. Right? That, that's a second very important trait of early stage companies. Right? Now, the third thing which, is, which matters more as companies grow bigger is the company performance itself. Right? So if you're able to demonstrate that you're uh, scaling, if you're, able to, if you're able to scale quickly, meaning that, and by the way, that's not easy, because every, you know, people, people say, okay, oh yeah, they, everybody's growing, 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 but growth comes with an enormous people cost. You have to hire, you have to retain, you have to find ways to inspire people to work those hours, right? And if your mission is not strong enough, people are happy getting a corporate job. They don't have to work that hard for that little pay. You do that because something matters to you that's bigger than you, right? And it's not easy to scale, and that's what uh, you have to be able to demonstrate. You have to be able to demonstrate profitability at some point. Now it's come sooner than later. Okay. So there are different things that matter at different stage of a company. Like if I was a late stage PE investor, uh -huh. I may not be looking, I will be giving more weightage to company performance and near-term plans than an early stage company. Like any VC who asks a seed stage new joiner, new, new startup to give five-year financial projections, I mean, there's no way anybody can do that, right? Uh -huh. So, but there are people who do ask for those things. So. Yeah, you raised three important points about what people like Sequoia look for, your founder, your market, and your performance, right? Let's look at the founder first, and what you say is very true. Um, you know, obviously, when you hire or when you fund someone who's come from Ivy League, for example, getting into Ivy League in itself is a, is a success. I mean, not everybody succeeds in getting to Yale, Stanford, even IAT, as you say. Um, should you then advise, you know, uh, young people to study their socks off, get into as good a university as possible, you know, MIT on a scholarship, for example? And in that process, you know, you get to the top of the distillation pyramid where you're already visible to the top tier. Would you advise that? On a lighter note, I went to Stanford on scholarship. <laughs> I thought I might mention that, but I didn't. <laughs> no, 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 I don't have my fee for this place. But uh, so it's a very personal choice. Uh, there is, uh, there is, I am biased, okay, because I chose that path. Well, it's not the only path. Uh -huh. With that said, I feel like I definitely, each experience for me was a change in a perception of the world. When I went to Stanford, okay, up until that point, I was one of the smartest kids in class. Okay. At that point, I realized I am definitely not the smartest kid in class. There were people there who were so accomplished. I got challenged in ways I had never been challenged. And I, I remember I used to say that I think I've learned more in six months of my master's than four years of undergrad. Because right? you're just challenged in such difficult ways. The, kinds of, you know, the kind of problems that we were solving at Stanford were so different from what I had picked up in undergrad. Um, then at Wharton, the second realization happened. There are more than one ways to be smart. Smart doesn't just mean good at math, good at coding, good at science, no. Smart can be you. Smart can be you, anybody, right? Like there's different flavors of smart, right? And that, that perception I think for me came from Wharton. Because there I met people who were Olympic basketball players, coal miners. You know, and I realized that all these people from all these different perspectives are coming in and contributing as well as any of those computer science kids that I had met at Stanford. So yes, it does help, but different people have different priorities and therefore there is no one right answer. I mean, I know that's like kind of a lame consulting answer, but <laughs> it's true. <laughs> no, what you say is true. Um, you know, obviously people at like Goldman Sachs, they hire the best and the brightest, right? The most accomplished academically, the most accomplished sportingly, and then they also look like a million bucks, right? And that's your typical Goldman's banker. 
Um, going on to the market, the second thing you talked about, Nippon, um, it's no accident that you're in Indonesia. 300 million people, you know, what is shaping up to be already ASEAN's biggest economy. You went there, not on a whim, but deliberately, right? Do you advise Malaysian entrepreneurs to get out of Dodge and go to Jakarta? Or India, for that matter, or, or China, for that matter? I mean, you know, let's call a spade a spade. This is a, you know, this is a postage stamp in a wide world, isn't it? It's tiny. Oh, well, it is a profitable market, uh -huh. but your point on the size is valid. Uh, I would say, see, I, I had a, I, again, life shapes up in different ways, right? So uh, I grew up a little bit in the Middle East, right? So I was, it wasn't like I was a frog in the well perspective, right? I already had a little bit of perspective from living in, in uh, Muscat, in Oman. Uh, and, you know, we were just talking about how I can read Arabic is because I grew up there, uh, right? And then I lived 10 years in the U.S., so for me, I'm Indian, my parents live in India, but for me, the whole, I, for me, it just was like any place is work. Wherever you find your passion, your, your drive is work. So if, uh, if there are people here who are motivated, you know, especially Indonesia for being, you know, if you're in KL, if you're in Malaysia, I mean, the language is very similar, the, it's not very far, uh, the cultural, there are lots of cultural similarities, why not, right? Again, there's nothing stopping an Indian guy from coming and doing it. So why can't a Malay person do it? You know, Malaysians are, Malaysians are just as capable. I mean, it's just human nature. There are, there are X percentage of people in any random population that you will pick who are risk takers, entrepreneurial, and so on. And that's not any different whether you're from Malaysia or from India or from anywhere else. I think it's just a little bit about what is accepted in your culture and sometimes, uh, you know, twenty-something kids don't. Uh, yeah, at least in India, it used to happen. I don't want to draw an analogy here because I don't know the twenty-something Malaysians. Maybe some of you guys could enlighten me. Uh, but in uh, back when back in my time, it was very rare because a lot of people were still saying, "Look for stable jobs." Right. So it was very unusual for someone like me to come out and say, "Oh, my dad, I want to start my company in you know second year of college." So. And now you guys are running the world. I mean, look at Satya Nadella, right, for example. Um, the third thing, right, the third thing that you talked about, which is the company performance. Now, we know that we are entering a new era of money, right, in the sense that in the last 12 years, money has been very cheap. Money has been almost free. But we're now entering a period where, as I think Howard Marks of Oak Tree Capital, he was on Bloomberg last night talking about how there's a new reckoning and there's a new era of basically maybe slower growth and, and more, I guess, more discerning money out there. So... For companies who are trying to position themselves for a new normal, right? Do they try and rewire their brains to get away from the, you know, the whiz bang days of the last ten years, and and move towards profits and more organic uh, returns, like top line revenue growth, for example? Should that be the new p pivots? Do you think, Nippon? I would definitely say there is a, there is a change, okay, but is the change first of its kind? No. Uh, let's go back to my first company, right, 1999. Uh, what we saw after that was this same industry of tech. Of course, it was much smaller, less mature, uh, less sophisticated in every sense of the word, go through a massive, like, it was a massive crash. Like, there is no other way to say it, right? And I was, I was in my, after my company shut down, I had to figure out what to do, right? Like, so I was, when I was recruiting for a job, there were no jobs on campus. There was nowhere to get hired. Uh, so I got the first, first one that I got, which was not a great one. Uh, but I never went for it, of course, because I ended up going for my master's. But what, the point I'm making is, it's not a new thing. So two things come from that. One, there is a light at the end of the tunnel, right? So the whole world is not always going to be like this. I mean, if it is, then we have massive reset in all over humanity, okay, let alone the tech industry. Uh, second, uh, the fundamentals of business haven't changed. 20, I would say 2020 and 2021 were, or maybe 2019 to 2021 were stronger aberrations. Right. That is the outlier, not this. I mean, this is just more of a 
rebound from that. So we should hit some sort of normal, respectable levels. Uh, but if, from a profitability standpoint, which is the other thing you talked about, yes, I think it matters. And I think everybody is focusing on it. You know, look, I'll, the other important point to make as, an, as to, to founders out there is uh, you have to imagine yourself, you know, if you're in a, in a sailboat. I give this analogy often because it resonates very strongly with me. And you have to be able to see which way the wind is blowing. If you don't grow, if you, let's suppose you're in a business that needs capital to grow, right? Like most businesses in our part of the world do need that because there is, the revenues catch up much later with the kind of capital required from, for hiring engineers and so on. Um, in that environment, you have to know when to hit the growth button and when to hit the profitability button. And sometimes they're not even mutually exclusive. Right. So again, early stage answers, different from growth stage answers, different from late stage answers. Uh, it, it is definitely a more capital preserving time for sure, for everybody. Uh, and I think that's again, not unusual. It happened in 2001, it happened in, nine, in 2008. It happened along the way a couple of times in minor, on minor scales. It's a big one. So as you say, capital is drying up. And, but even before this reset happened, Nippon, uh, Malaysian entrepreneurs have lamented. I mean, the common refrain has it been that capital hasn't been that abundant, nor is capital that intelligent or strategic in Malaysia. They've got to go out to Singapore, Hong Kong, and try and raise elsewhere. Malaysian capital is notoriously thin, and I mean, dare I say it, less knowledgeable than what you might find in even Singapore, right? Um, how do you get over that? I mean, when you sit in Sequoia, when you used to sit in Sequoia, I'd like to wager that you never bought once in, invested in a Malaysian entrepreneur, correct? Did you even invest in an Asian entrepreneur? I don't know. Did you? Well, I mean, why, why not? So there are two points there. But, um, Sequoia as a firm did invest in Malaysian founders. Um, I did not because I was in India. Uh, second, I would, I would say, you know, okay, uh, the best example I can give is myself, right? The Indian market is massive, okay? And yet, here I am in Southeast Asia, right? There are no borders for entrepreneurs. And that's not just in tech. That's been around forever, right? Like, I mean, the... Uh, the Europeans ventured out in the, in, and, and, and found their own ways of making money. Uh, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it having an impact. They definitely made money, though. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, and, and you know, people have ventured out always. Like, that is just humanity. Like, you know, entrepreneurs come and go. Entrepreneurship stays. That's just the rule of life. No, yeah, I mean, I think Qualcomm is owned by a Malaysian, but his business is not in Malaysia. It's, you know, in the U.S. Yes. And why does, that, why does it even matter? I think that's the point I'm trying to make. Is you, if you have the capabilities, if you dream big, then why would you not assume that the world is your marketplace? So why didn't you build in India? I mean, you've got over a billion people there. In Indonesia, it's a third of that. Less. Well, combination of reasons. Uh -huh. Some are logical, and I can explain them. Some are emotional, and I cannot explain them. They just happen. Like you feel, sometimes you just feel something is right, and you do it. So that's, the, that's easier to say, harder to know. The logical part was, so around when I joined Sequoia in 2014, uh -huh, is when we did the Series A checks into Tokopedia, and then subsequently into Gojek. Right? And I was at the firm watching these companies grow like I've never seen growth before. Now remember that I had left the US to move to India because India was going through a growth spurt at the time in 2011-2012. Right? And the, the ecosystem was maturing, it was rapidly growing. Now the one important difference of course between the two ecosystems is the, is the number and quality of engineers that's been produced. Uh -huh. And I think in that, on that department, Southeast Asia has more catching up to do. But on the other hand, Southeast Asia has a higher, like, if you, okay, I, I was just telling you earlier, right, like, I don't think ASEAN is one region, re, one entire region where each country has too many different cultural nuances. But 
if you assume that is one, re one region, then the, econ the size of the economy is as big, if not bigger, than India. The per capita income is higher than India. The digital penetration is higher than India. The literacy is higher than India. So why should anybody not build for this region? Right? On the, and, and, and to make matters, uh, the other logical aspect was when, when you're an early stage company, you're going to see how, what market are you targeting? Are there people who are big, established, capable, with defensible moats, defensible capital who are in the market? At the time when I started this, there, was, there wasn't anybody. Right? On the other hand, in India, there was Reliance, which is the biggest uh, company, like uh, biggest conglomerate, one of the biggest conglomerates in India. There was Flipkart going after the space. There was Amazon going after the space. You know, and there were lots of startups going after the space. So did it make sense to have one more person to do the same problem? No. So I picked a different field. And then the emotional reasons, which you can't explain? Well, I, I think it's hard to explain, which is why I was saying that it's emotional, is I've spent six months in the market in, uh, in Indonesia. In the market? Share markets or No, bazaars? market, market like bazaars, like, uh, yeah, meeting warungs, talking to, you know, I, I think, okay, maybe this is a better articulation. I lived in the Middle East. I lived in the US. I came to Indonesia. Okay, and Singapore, of course. Uh -huh. And to me, the best thing, I, the thing that, the emotional part that I connected with was, I did not feel like I was unwelcome or a foreigner or some sort of xenophobia of any kind in Indonesia. It felt like I could connect, I could understand how business gets done, how people talk, how people, like it's fundamental Asian culture. Like the difference between the US and India in terms of how business is done and how we operate is very different. The, the, on the other hand, when I came to Indonesia, I realized that it's similar to India. I'll give you an example, actually, to illustrate my point. Uh -huh. I met somebody for, someone introduced me to somebody, and this somebody is a, you know, I would say a, fam a relatively famous person uh -huh, in Indonesia, and I, I had a chance to meet this individual at like 6 p.m. or something, and it was a one hour meeting. I think up until 6.45 maybe, we were just talking about weather, politics, family, sports, everything other than why I came. And in the last 15 minutes, it was like, tell me how I can help you. I was like, oh my God, this is just like India. <laughs> so yeah, you, you know, you, it tends to be more human relationship centric than, than uh, like if I had gone in the US, it, Again, you cannot stereotype these things, but again, just to, to illustrate, in the US, it would have been a very fact-based conversation. That's just how two different cultures are. No, I agree. I mean, I, you know, I've been told Jokowi is quite a humble guy. I, I don't know whether it's Jokowi, I'm just joking. <laughs> I wish. Okay, we're that 30, is an aspiration. <laughs> okay, we're 30 minutes into the conversation, and I've been given 10 minutes by the organizers to ask you tough questions, okay? Okay. This is to wake up the audience. Here we go. Okay. Anybody yawning, you can wake up. <laughs> okay. Everybody's laying people off, including Grab, uh, including Twitter, including Facebook. Did you go through that? And did you lay off people to manage costs in these tough times? How did that go? Wow. I didn't realize tough would be like that tough. <laughs> yes, we did. Uh, we in... I remember so vividly, like it was... Uh, on November 30th, we did our town hall, and we had to announce a reduction of 25% of our people. And that was, that's just tough. That is, I don't know what to say, it's tough. Yes. Uh -huh. And I think from a, from a cost perspective, uh -huh, it matters. But it was, well, you know, a, few, a few things happened. Uh -huh. One of the things that now I realize is a lot of our people found jobs very quickly. So it, in some ways, it was a weight off of our shoulders. Uh, but that's the ULA side of things. But to a broader question of you know, Facebook and Amazon and so on, um, I think there is a cyclical process that is happening. It is unfortunate, but there was, uh, I think it is just, you know, yeah, the cycle, the cycle happens. Now, whether 
how where does somebody draw the line how do they feel what is right what is wrong how do they treat the people that's what makes the difference at least from my perspective as a founder is if i've spent all this time energy convincing somebody to join the mission and one has to remember that the people who came into ula i don't know if the same is true for facebook or other companies but the people who came to ula had many other opportunities that they could have gone to right they made a choice to come to us so i owed it to them to hand to that so that that would be handled more sensitively right now bigger companies i don't know it i haven't personally encountered i think there may be there may be multiple factors at work and how they treat people is probably more process driven and more because it's so many you know yeah and of course as you say cycles and thanks to adlin we know how much you raised in your last round that was a different era though right and valuations in those days even as recent as maybe 2 years ago were much maybe much more optimistic not going to talk about the value of your multiples right now or your valuations nippon but do you think that you might come to a time when you have to redraw those multiple those valuations and start to scale back those expectations do you think because of where we are now in the cycle yes yeah, so this is a fantastic question right there's uh i think if we talk about public markets forget private markets or ula or startups or whatever if you talk about public markets right when the stock prices fall people don't say oh the valuation fell it's accepted as a matter of practice that stock prices go up the stock prices go down and the reason why people don't talk about it is because it's a day to day process it's a minute by minute second by second process right the prices are being optimized by the market right in the private markets transactions don't happen on a microsecond basis so people talk about valuations and the assumption is that valuation should only go up but a valuation is just the number of shares multiplied by the share price so the share and the share price is what investors are willing to buy the shares of that company at so if the public market share prices can go up or down shouldn't private market share prices go up or down they don't only go up right so i think it's very important to understand that it is at the end of the day a share price right. now is there a reset in order yes because again I, i assume there may also be some business school students here you know you would have heard about the capital asset pricing model one of the most important ingredients in that is your risk free rate when the risk free rate goes up it affects the valuation of the company any company public company private company doesn't matter it affects it brings it down right uh -huh. so a reset is definitely required if the risk free rate goes up that's just financial math so as an ecosystem that matters now the second problem which is i think a more more personal to all the people in this room is that when the us markets fall like the way they have fallen imagine if you were a guy sitting in the us with your money would you say oh yeah oh my god facebook is available for so cheap it's fallen i don't know 60 70% from its peak should i buy that should i put my 100 dollars in that stock or should i put my 100 dollars in i don't know some indian or indonesian company which is still uncertain and early and so on right so capital also makes a choice right and in that situation the capital for regions such as ours tends to be more cautious right and again this is not any one individuals doing you know contrary to what lots of media speculation happens it's not about you know that oh the valuations were bloated this and that yes they were but there was also a time when the risk free rate was zero does it put off you know investors from putting in more money to work in this region um what happens if you know you raised at a certain high you know level 2 years ago and now your valuation is you know what it you know a fraction of that maybe even underwater for other investors right i mean we've seen how hello gold has just recently closed its doors as well um that funding difficulties is real it's clear and present right what happens then how how do you talk to investors who are fearful that their watermarks are being you know drawn down investors are human beings right also and i think there's uh 
most people understand if you're doing if you're committed and you're doing the things that you should be doing right to be more capital efficient to get more juice out of what you have for the most part unless i'm i'm yet to meet someone very irrational who says yeah okay because see the way most funds work okay the way most funds work is that even when they enter right now okay let's take the example of a venture fund which is more early stage fund there is something called the power law okay power law means that let's say a fund makes 50 investments in 50 companies only 5 out of those will be so big that they will give most of the returns of that fund so even when they enter a company they know that let's say 90% of the companies are going to die and that's the nature of the startup risk but those 10% that survive more than make up for the loss of the remaining companies that don't survive right so the other thing to keep the second thing to keep in mind as a venture fund is that you're entering with a 7 to 10 year view and like i was saying earlier if this cycle lasts 10 years like this then we have bigger issues in the world right most recessionary cycles and we haven't even officially called it a recession uh -huh, and at least not in this part of the world because again malaysia indonesia are commodity rich markets right uh -huh, that's not going to change but let's say let's talk about the us like the us maybe of course is going through a cycle right so but is that if you look at previous history whether it was at least through my conscious memory of the 99 height and then and then and then the drop and the, then the resumption after that and then the 2008 cycle as well it does take time it it makes life very hard for 2 3 years but those who survive those 2 3 years emerge stronger amazon almost died you know most of my friends when i was at stanford told me not to join amazon can you believe that why because it was going to go bankrupt most of the folks in this audience would not cannot believe that there was a time where amazon had almost gone bankrupt it was like so difficult it was an enormously difficult time and they were resilient they built things they survived they ran the software stack for toys r us and target toys r us went bankrupt not amazon <laughs> right so the resilience of the people who come out of this cycle is going it's going to just prove those those companies will carry the next 10 years of the tech boom at least that's my view and that's also my hope i am an entrepreneur i am an optimist well i mean by all accounts this region has been unloved well less loved than the rest of the world for some years i mean when bukalapa you know too much fanfare listed in jakarta they've gone south ever since grab which listed in new york has gone south since then uh, go to as well has gone south since then what are you going to do i mean when the time comes for you to consider the exit nippon right for your investors to leave the you know stage left gracefully um do you go to the west or do you stay in the east what do you do you mean to raise money or to grow the well, business to, well i mean obviously when you uh, ipo is to raise money right yeah yeah, yeah. uh -huh. different schools of thought okay uh -huh. different markets value different things uh -huh. if you're an indonesian firm like bukalapak and you feel like your brand equity is stronger in indonesia it may make more sense to list in indonesia but the indonesian market and frankly not just indonesian market all our markets here other than the more like let's say other than the more the bigger markets are less liquid markets the amount of capital the sophistication of capital how many analysts cover companies all of those things are much more sophisticated in the us right so a us ipo is scrutinized way more than again you can't make blanket statements but the us as a market overall is more sophisticated and more liquid and more uh discerning but they don't seem to understand grab though right grab is what 75% down still 75% down or so is meta yeah right and meta is an, as american as it gets so uh again it's it's more about the what what are the numbers saying right and i'm and i'm pretty sure we all know grab like i can't even imagine my life without grab right i wouldn't know how to go from point a to point b i wouldn't know what to do about food delivery like that is that is uh grab and gojek have changed southeast asia in ways that we cannot imagine like and that that 
um, it's, if consumers were the only place, right, then a Wall Street investor would look at it and say, oh, wow. But the Wall Street investor, like I was saying earlier, has a choice. If they have $100, okay, let's say they have $100 million to invest, would they do it in a meta stock that they understand and, and, uh, and has cash flows which are more positive and stronger? Or would they do it in, at, and at that price? Or would they do it in a grab? I mean, different people make different choices. I am long on, I'm long on this ecosystem. I would totally, I was, I was telling you earlier, like to me, Shopee, uh, Gojek, Tokopedia, Grab are all, if you take a 10 year view, are all here to stay. Uh, the economies are growing, the people are getting richer, they have almost become a essential part of life uh, that even if they raise prices or if they start making more efforts around that place, like I'll tell you, Grab made a small tweak that pained me, but I see why they did it. Like you, before in Singapore, they had a five minute wait allowed. Like, okay, we, meaning that if the driver shows up and, and you get the message that your driver is here, um, you had five minutes before they added three Singapore dollars to your fare for, as penalty. They reduced five minutes to three minutes. Now I don't even have time to tie my shoelaces. Okay. <laughs> so, so I keep losing those three dollars once in a while, but again, it adds up for grab. It's straight, it's, it's, it's uh, bottom line impact. So over time, I think they will grow. Similarly, we are seeing this happening in Shopee. Commissions are going up. Uh, in other places, free delivery is being reduced. It pinches in the short run as consumers, but in the long run, consumers also adapt. Uh, and we've seen this market after market. If you take a long, long enough view, the public markets may not be taking the same long-term lens as we are taking over here. So uh, just imagine if you put $1,000 into Amazon, Microsoft, Netflix in early 2000s. You don't need to work today anymore, right? Okay, so um, Jeff Bezos, right? Now, Jeff Bezos didn't just invest in you. He invested in you from his family office, which is interesting. It's not from Amazon coffers, personal coffers. Now, he invested in you as the first, I th and I think, only e-commerce player, not just in Southeast Asia, but Asia, right? Why? Because you're ex-staff? No, I'm just joking. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> first of all, I need to, you know, every forum, I have to express my gratitude for that happening. Because it wasn't just a, uh, it was a factor of so many things falling into place. Uh -huh. I am told, I will admit, I, I, I never spoke personally with Jeff. Uh, and the last time I saw him was when I was at Amazon and that dude was in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Uh, but I do know that, uh, I'm told that he, he liked our vision. Uh, and, and what we were doing, and we, uh, the, the person who is our point of contact uh, is, an, is a very smart uh, but incredibly humble lady who evaluated the deal and recommended it to Jeff. And Jeff, he, I am told, he read the memo, and which of course I had written because I know how to write Amazon memos, uh, and uh, I, I, I'm kidding partly, but I did, I did send her a memo and I'm sure she must have, you know, borrowed at, little, at least a little bit from it. Uh, and that, uh, I'm told he, he liked our vision and what we wanted to do and yeah, I was, I, I was, I think one of the most memorable moments of my life was when they said yes. Okay. Now the other part, sorry, this, is the, this is the other reason why, uh, since you said only e-commerce, it was timing, okay? There are things you can claim credit for in life, and there are some things that fall into your lap, okay? But when they fall into your lap, you should be humble enough to admit that they've fallen into your lap, which was that in July 2021, he stopped being CEO of Amazon and moved out of an executive role, which was exactly the time when Series B was happening for us. So him approving the, the deal him approving the vision, all of that was also enabled by the fact that he was no longer in an executive capacity in Amazon, so another e-commerce company is not a conflict. Right? Although you, I don't imagine myself com being conflicting with Amazon, but okay. <laughs> you know, I wish someday we can be like that, but, uh, but that's, that was also partly luck, and that's okay. Nipun, can we play a game? 
Uh-oh. It's only going to last. Didn't prepare for me with that. It's only it's only going to last sixty seconds, right? Now, can we imagine we're in a lift, right? Okay. Um, and you're at the Malaysian Petroleum Club restaurant having lunch, and you get into the lift, and in the lift with you, only you, is Jeff Bezos, right? You've got sixty seconds to get from the Malaysian Petroleum Club restaurant to the ground floor. What do you say to him? What's your elevator pitch? Can we role play that for the crowd? About for pure Ula? entertainment? Yeah, obviously you want to raise money for Ula, right? <laughs> What's the elevator pitch? What do you say? Hey, Jeff, blah. What is that blah? The Amazon of Southeast Asia will not be Amazon in its current model. It will be a different model. And I know what that is. Tell, tell me more, Nippon. It, you just said make the pitch. There we go. <laughs> the rest of it will take an hour. Okay. okay. Now, entrepreneurs like Ananda Krishnan, have gone to India, uh, Indonesia and failed. Uh, various other Malaysian entrepreneurs, much, more, much older than you, have gone there and failed. What does it take to succeed in Indonesia? Can you define fail? I think he pulled out. I think he left the country with his tail between his legs. I think, right? Correct me if I'm wrong. Ananda Krishnan f- didn't make it with Telco in Indonesia, right? No, but I, I think there is... Well, I was trying to be a little sneaky there, okay. Well, I'm the one who's sneaky, right? Yeah. It was, uh, look, I, I know all startups carry a certain amount of risk. All businesses carry a certain amount of risk. The risk is different in different types. Like some, some companies, like startup companies, are more trying to imagine the world 10 years from now. And the world that you imagine from 10 years may not how it shapes up. I mean, the best example of that is Back to the Future. How many people here have watched that movie? In, they arrive in 2023. You know that? They arrive in 2023. They have flying cars, but they have no smartphones. So all that they could imagine at the time was a flying car, which you don't have. But what they could not imagine was that a computer would fit in your pocket. Right? So the future is going to be so different, and we're all trying to get there. So who knows? Other companies have other risks, like telcos and so on, may have debt, may have... And, and you know, there are some times that you have to... Uh, if you're not from the country, you don't know the culture, you don't know the ways of how things work. It could be many reasons. But that doesn't mean you didn't try. So that's why I was being sneaky on the word fail, because somebody out there went and tried. And I think to me personally, and this, can, this is again a very personal opinion, to have tried something and it didn't work is a better answer to have never tried at all. Right? And that's how we build at Ula, is we try stuff. Because even we don't know exactly what will work. If I could sit in a boardroom and draw out what the future is going to look like, I'll, I'm sure shot recipe for failure. You've got to try on the ground. Better to have loved and lost than to have not loved at all, right? I borrowed it from there. That's right. How do you scale fast? How have you been scaling in, in Indonesia? What's the you know, TLDR here? Going back to that why fund IIT people example, it wasn't just growing in these two years. We grew a supply chain focused business in the middle of COVID. Right? And we were able to do it because we had a fantastically committed team who was working day in and day out. All of us were. Uh-huh. And you know, the people on the field, I just, you know, and just imagine how grateful one should be. There are people in warehouses, there are people in delivery trucks delivering goods you know, at, before the vaccines were invented. Right? with masks, with sanitizers, and so on. So it is about commitment, it is about the grid, it is about wanting to make something happen. You know, lots of speed bumps come along the way, and you just have to try not to topple over. So what's next for Ola? Because, I mean, Indonesia alone is a big market, at least from a headline level, but you've got tons of islands, and it's not exactly one contiguous mass. Do you scale into the rest of the country, like, you know, Sulawesi and you know, Java and, and what have you, or do you go into the region? And what's the plan there? What so, do investors expect of you? Okay, I, I should also clarify one thing. Uh, I'm fortunate that investors and I jointly come up with expectations. Nobody tells me what needs to be done and I have to do. Uh, we figure it out together as a, as a board, as a working group. Wait, how do you get to that point? Joint expectation management. How do you do that? 
I think you have to take people along. Like again, let's let's go back to uh -huh, okay. This is I, I think this is a very useful point. Do you mind if I spend a couple of minutes on it? Okay. Uh -huh. The younger founders sometimes I've seen, and again, this is not true for all. It does seem to be a little bit of a pattern. Is you almost think of your investor as your boss. The board meeting as an exam. Okay. It's not. Okay, first of all, you have to remember that the investor, your, if, you have, if you have a, for example, let's say a venture investor, the venture investor is, in, as, is an investor in, maybe they, ha they hold 20 other boards or 10 other boards. Right? And it's not like they're spending day in, day out, 24 seven, the way the founder is on one problem. Right? So they're not, they're not there to tell you what to do. And in fact, if an investor is telling you on a day-to-day -day basis what to do, that's overreach and should be pushed back on. That's not their job. Right. Now, your job as a founder is to say that, okay, you're putting in the hours, you're, putting in the, you're getting the feedback from the ground. This other person who's in your board has a bird's eye view of things, and they have a bird's eye view of many things which is why it is so valuable to have someone like that who sees business model after business model day in and day out. But how do you use that? If you use that to say, tell me what to do, okay, that's not gonna work because they don't know what you can and cannot do. And if you don't do that and you say, I know everything because I'm doing this all day and day long, you don't tell me what to do, then you have the opposite problem. You've lost perspective, right? And that's what I mean by figuring it out jointly. I try to do that with all my investors. And I, I kid you not, I get to five different perspectives. And then it's my job to piece it together, figure out what is right for Ula, and present it back to them saying, this is what I heard from all of you. This is why I think that plan A, plan B, plan C, or whatever it might be, makes most sense. Do we all agree? And then everybody is a mature individual in that room. And if, even if they don't agree, uh -huh, to something, they will say, okay, you know better than we do. At least that's what the good investors would do. Yeah, I think it was Russell Peters who once said that Chinese people and Indian people can work together, but you've also got Tencent on board as investors, right? Um, we talked a lot about, <laughs> just a bad joke, right? We talked a lot about Sequoia and their expectations. What all about Tencent? What do they bring to the table? What are their expectations? I mean, how do the different complexions of your investors you know, f inform your decision making? Yeah, uh, another a very important point you touch upon. Uh -huh. the, okay, so Tencent is a company. Like it's, a, it's not a fund, and there's a very big difference between funds and companies. Funds usually have a structure where they will, there's a bunch of people who come together to create that fund, and they're called gen general partners or GPs, and then they take money from other people to invest on their behalf, who are called LPs. Um, limited partners, they have a job of returning the money back at a sum, like the promise, well promise as in whatever, it's performance based, but they have ex there's an expectation that some amount of money, some amount of capital returns will be made over say seven, ten years of that fund and returned back to the LPs, which means there is a start and there is an end to a fund. If a fund that you're raising money from has let's say two years left in its cycle, it doesn't happen, but let's say it does, uh, then you would be under pressure two years later to give them an exit. Right? Uh -huh. But a balance sheet investor, you know, Tencent, Process, whatever, there's a whole bunch, Alibaba, all of these, all of the folks who are part of usually companies rather than funds, and I, I'm grossly simplifying all things, right? Okay, so just uh, bear with me. Don't necessarily have the same constraints. If they feel something is working, if they feel something is making sense, there is no contractual pressure to exit. Right? So it always makes sense to have somebody like that on your cap table. Uh -huh. Whether Tencent, whether others, I mean, that's, that's all subjective. But once you hit a certain stage, it's nice to have someone who can think 10 years right? and not worry about, oh, my fund cycle is ending. That's an important con consideration. For someone like Tencent, they've been so helpful in perspective on China. Right? What worked, what didn't work, why did it work, why did it not work? I get, see India, I have first-hand knowledge, and I have enough people I know there who 
tell me what works, what didn't work, and why. In China, they're my, they're my source, right? And they've, been in, they've seen the whole journey from like um, how, you know, I don't know, call it the taxi hailing companies, the fa fast fashion companies, the social commerce companies, the food delivery companies, they've seen it all. So you get to understand perspective that uh, isn't available otherwise, especially for someone like me who's never, who, who doesn't know the Chinese ecosystem as well. Do they want you to go there? Would you consider going there? You mean China? take Ula there? Yeah. I hope someday, yeah, but they don't, they haven't said anything to that effect. <laughs> 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 See, again, I am, I am an aspirational optimist, okay? So, someday. But I think I speak on behalf of everybody in the room, and of course virtually, that this, in your replies, were really a one-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So thank you for sharing your insights, and uh, we will all be listening to the gong on the New York Stock Exchange when you do go public in the not-so-near future, okay? In the not-too-distant future, rather. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your thank thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming here.